in the retail business every day every uh, hour is a new challenge for us so every customer we meet has new requirements and you cannot treat one customer the same way you treated the previous customer you call it the car business i call it the e-commerce i think the best businesses are built when everyone is winning so it's very interesting because you've simplified this whole win 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 in just two sentences but it's extremely hard to orchestrate in a large organization it's not everything that is in dubai is made of gold uh, it's it's a country which has been meticulously planned by the rulers of the country so right. and it has been happening for the uh, for the last 40 50 years where they have been planning a car would be the second most expensive asset they would own in right. life type up the home yeah after property uh, generally Cars are the second most expensive assets that we. Buy. Hi and welcome to one more episode of the State of Retention Marketing Podcast. Today's conversation is with Anurag Gaurav. He is in a very seasoned leader in the Middle East region, working with one of the largest car reselling platforms. Uh, we've had a uh, interesting introduction so far. We some we seem to know a whole bunch of common things about places we've uh, known. So where I grew up and where his in-laws are is the same place called Udaipur. Thanks so much for doing this, Nanurat. Super excited to have you here. Thank you, thank you, Ankur, for letting me. Awesome. So just as the you know starting point of the conversation goes, Nanurat, love to understand the contours of your journey to this point. You've been an operations person, and now you're running a fairly large part of the business, as I'm able to understand. Would love to understand how this journey played out. What were the choices you made? How much of this was planned? How much of this was incidental? Well, I'll say I've been very blessed in my professional journey uh, and also in my personal journey. But in in terms of professional journey, definitely there is nothing that I planned out. So the only thing I planned out was I was pretty sure when everyone was doing the IT management part, the MCA part, I was pretty sure I wanted to do an MBA. So I did my five-year MBA in in marketing and HR, something that I still love. And I was very blessed to get recruited by ITC at that time. ITC was expanding its retail base. There was a concept. Right. Uh, Uh, like a mini Walmart concept of ITC Chapal Sagar, it didn't fly off, but they were the first one to bring in that concept. And I was very lucky that as a fresher, I got an opportunity to manage that business and open the new outlets for them. That was brilliant. And while I was still there, I was picked by Sharab Digi. The Sharab Digi is still the largest electronics chain in this part of the region. And I worked with them for five years, which was another brilliant experience in terms of increasing business P and L management in terms of. uh interacting with loads of customers like at one stage we right. had 14 cash tills uh, flooded with customers and we were all we could do was serve the customers with water there was such long well, queues the waiting time to get it built was more than an hour and then the experience went on with alfutem where i worked with them for about 8 years uh, managing their electronics business and then in the last 3 and a half 4 years i was managing their sports and lifestyle business so uh, all all the experiences before that were up related to somehow sales and the last experience with alfutem with, with the sports and lifestyle business was looking after the sales and the buying part also so i was dealing with brands like adidas and reebok uh traveling around the globe getting this this opportunity with selenica actually came in uh, i mean surprisingly because i had no experience in cars so when i was first approached by the hr i thought it someone is playing a prank with me so i, I didn't right. even take it seriously Mm-hmm. eventually when i met the founder uh, the only question i asked him it was a nice chat but the only question i asked him was why me like i could destroy your business and he was like no we want someone from retail uh, but right. the exact reason why we want you here is you are not from a car background but when i joined the business i i joined with the notion that either i'll get fired in 6 months or i'll leave the business in 6 months uh, this will be the first short stint here i am four and a half years later very happy with the business uh, I think business is also okay, and I love the yeah, business. I'm sure it's pretty happy with you. <laughs> I am happy with the business. So not many employees around the globe can say that, but I probably say that I'm very happy with the business that I am into. Uh, it's it's a startup. It, we have been here for ten years. We still like to call ourselves uh, like a startup. We work like a startup. But it's a brilliant concept, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, of course, the time to come. But it's a brilliant concept. Very happy. so i didn't plan anything meticulously there was nothing that i knew in mind i was not clear where i want to be when i reach 40 right uh, it's just things fell into place for me and i've been blessed in that sense very interesting so you know you spoke about electronics you spoke about retail you spoke about sports and then you went into cars what is the similarity and what are the differences customers are the similarity that everywhere you go it's the customers i i love the front end i'm very passionate about retail business and whether right. it is electronics or whether it is sports and lifestyle uh, 
or even today that we are you call it the car business i call it the e-commerce we are not into car business we are actually into e-commerce everywhere the challenge and the common factor here is customers so of course right. the challenges keep on changing uh, sports industry uh, goes through a different challenge in terms of inventory management electronics industry when we were there the we were there at the peak of electronic industry in front of my eyes i have seen uh, the nokia share go down from 67% to 3% being captured by blackberry then dominate the market and you remember you the times happened, when we were right? using these blackberry messengers so all that has changed in front of my eyes when i was in electronics where we went from nokia to blackberries to then iphones and then samsung's and the note series and then the lg launching the first 3d model yeah. all this has happened so the challenges have been different but but the one common factor has been the customers you know, so is retail to you the whole act of the customer experience when he is in your store physically conversing with you and how do you do a great job there or is that just the nature of uh, scaling up the nature of data the nature of consumer insights that you generate and translate back into strategy when you say you love the whole retail consumer facing stuff yeah. what do we mean see the thing is uh, what i mean here is that it's a new challenge every day uh, you don't have the same situation it's what? uh I I cannot do a job which is monotonous which I have to come and do every day. I cannot do that. Right. Everyone is built differently. In the retail business, every day, every uh, hour is a new challenge for us. So every customer we meet has new requirements, and you cannot treat one customer the same way you treated the previous customer. So every right. customer has specific requirement. Personalization is a buzzword where we we have been talking about the personalization for the last ten years. Well, right. guess what? We are still working on it. No one is perfect at that art here. Yeah, that is where it. I I love that experience, that feedback, that voice into data because I am at the same time as much as I love retail, I'm also a P&L guy. So my entire focus has been on and turning companies profitable or increasing the market right. share or profitability, and that's what I love to do. That the end game for all these things is that I think the best businesses are built when everyone is winning, and. in our business or any any business you talk about you talk about electronics where there would be a sharab dg and there would be a samsung and then there would be a customer you talk about a sports and lifestyle where there would be an adidas and there would be us al kutte when there would be a customer or even in this business where we have us we have our partners who are dealers and then we have got customers the best businesses are built when all three parties win when the customer mm-hmm. is happy with what he is getting when the dealer is happy with what he is getting or the partner is happy with what he is getting and we are also happy and that's what my aim is it's not about generating profits it's about generating businesses which are scalable which are profitable and which are also liked by the customers because once you are in through that zone where the customers like you and instead of started wanting you they start needing you that's when the profitable business comes into play It's very interesting because you've simplified the whole win-win-win in just two sentences, but it's extremely hard to orchestrate in a large organization. The kinds you've been talking about, right? An Alpha Tem or a place like you are right now. Not small companies, not five people in a room that you can just tell that okay, this is how we think and this is how we have to do it. So it's a complex people orchestration problem at some level. What's what's your lens on it? How do you drive this uh, through the organization? See, so it's my in my experience, personal experience. Uh, uh, larger the organizations are more difficult it is because then there are different approvals that you have to get yeah and i've been part of fairly large organizations like sharab dg and alpha there and not that they're not good they're brilliant in what they are doing sure. but i think my this is my first experience with a startup this uh, right. business of selling a car it's much smaller business as compared to where i have worked at alpha then before of course and i found things to be much easier here comparatively mm-hmm. because i don't have to go to a uh, different approval chains uh, no idea is a bad idea we discuss yes. everything on the table in this business um, we do everything we take everything as an ab test uh, the entire motto in our management team is listen to the customer and there is a feedback right. coming from a customer we don't we almost never say that the customer is wrong we never say oh it's one customer we are always taking that feedback and we are reviewing our processes whether mm. there is something where which needs improvement which needs to change at our end yeah. and even if it's a small percentage of customers who want that change why not if it even if it's a one percentage of customers uh, our process change can make them happy that one percent why not so i found this to be more yeah. easier here but in bigger organization uh, i mean there are strengths with big, bigger organizations as well you have large teams to do it in a startup uh, everyone is doing everything so you you can call me the country director you can 
top call me whatever it is but then i am with the marketing and i am with the hr and i am with the sales and i am with the sourcing so everywhere uh, you have to be involved our ceo is personally involved most of our team members are personally involved into everything that we do and that's where the fun right. comes in and large organizations i think the teams are uh, limited to their specific roles and it works like a engine right you know uh, yes. if you if i take an example of a car so the gear has its own uh, function and the steering wheel has its own function and the brakes have their own function so as long as everything is working properly the car runs smoothly right one function doesn't perform it stops everything so yeah. that's the difference i would say absolutely so somewhere trade the resources with the agility i think in a larger corporation there are resources a smaller side there is agility yeah so this gives you a faster way to do things so anur tell us about the car business in the middle east it's a uh, quite an interesting car market the kind of vehicles i've seen on the roads and i've seen in the showrooms are quite fascinating right yeah. so tell us um, you know your journey has been four and a half years now what does the landscape look like how are you playing it what's your positioning what's your uh, let's say uh, lens on how to grid uh more customers into your game how does it all look together come together see i'll, I'll first of all uh, break the shackles here not everything that is in dubai is made of gold uh, it's it's a country which has been meticulously planned by the rulers of the country so oh. and it has been happening for the uh, for the last 40 50 years where they have been planning for today and that's why dubai is what dubai is today it's the infrastructure that allows you to do business here it's the infrastructure that allows people uh to come in and go out with freedom and have profitable businesses so it's uh it's not that uh, all the cars running on on sheikh zayed road are ferraris there are all type of customers i know in the videos uh, back home when we see everything, everything looks so shiny but uh, in our business also we are into the car business for example i'll give you live examples yeah. on a daily basis we are uh, we have online evaluation of thousands of customers they are coming online sure uh, we are doing physical inspection for hundreds of customers on a daily basis we are buying cars on a daily basis hmm. on a daily basis ankur we are getting cars which are worth 1500 dirhams and there yeah. are cars which are worth 1.5 million dirhams so we yeah. are getting a car which is barely moving we actually buy when we say that sell any car we actually mean it we we oh, even yeah. buy cars without engine so we don't have right. a problem <laughs> It's, it's a reality <laughs> we buy cars oh. not moving and then we buy cars uh, uh, just yesterday we bought a rolls royce was 2.05 million so it's it's something which is coming in on a daily basis uh, we see different seg- uh, customer needs we see different customer segments and for us uh, if i may talk about my own business hmm. uh, sell any car was the first business that entered the online fray in in this region okay uh, we started in 2013 so we have that first movers advantage we have gone through the struggles so when you first in the uh, uh, market and you are successful it's easy to say oh they are successful yeah. they had the first movers advantage but sure. anyone who enters the market first has the challenge challenge of educating the market of and there is a cost associated with it absolutely which the number 2 and number 3 will never face right so i was not here 10 years ago sagin was our ceo and founder the one who built this business mm-hmm. but 10 years ago i'm sure he would have faced the struggles where a market which was to- totally offline and it in right. large parts even today it is offline mm-hmm. and he would have gone outside and told people hey i'm building an app where you can come and sell your car through the app and the dealer can buy the bid on the car and buy the car on app and all this in 30 minutes so it would have come with their challenges but right. as of today and we can go into more details later if you want but sure. uh, as of today i think uh, you were talking about the landscape it's a huge market uh, that we have uh, good enough for multiple players to survive yeah. we have the pole position because uh, of our policies processes because our customers are happy of course we came to the market first so we have the largest network of dealers that we right. one could have in this region we are not limited to uae so we have got dealers who export cars to different parts of the country uh, sure. yes for example oman for example Uh, we have got dealers sitting in iraq and egypt so all all over the place there are dealers who are buying from us uh, on a regular basis uh, we have that position because we have been upgrading ourselves as per the customer feedback as per the right. feedback of our dealers so we are in a pretty cool position uh, the thing is we never uh, feel comfortable uh, we always are looking to improve and grow so we someone from outside would always see oh they are always running so are they struggling well we are not we are working on the next big idea so that's what we do all the time mm. so behind all those rolls royces and the ferraris and the stock engine vehicles is this complex 
Kaizen, which is an ongoing improvement engine. Absolutely. Uh, so in some sense, uh, the whole role of technology in kind of enabling this experience to get a lot smoother than would it would have been 10 years ago when when you guys were starting this operation or when the founding team was starting this operation. The experience changed substantially. There's a certain amount of education that was needed. I'm sure there's a lot of assisted uh, stuff that must have happened where people didn't necessarily do the entire journey on their own, uh, but they needed assistance at several steps. How has that part evolved over the last few years in terms of how much users are able to do independently? Well, uh, I would say uh, a lot has been changed post 2006, right? 2006 is the time where the technology had really started to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, internet was always there, but how people were using internet has changed. Even for in cases of you and me, Ankur, uh, 2005, 2006 is where we were use, still using, I think, desktops or we were still moving from desktops to laptops. Right. Uh, over the next 10 years from 2006, we moved from laptops to kind of smartphones, but with limited right. use. iPads yeah. and tablets were in favor. And today everyone is on phone. So you check yeah. your mails on phone, you, you are WhatsApping on phone, yeah. everything is on phone, your banking is on phone, everything is on phone. Hmm. So I think technology is a big factor. Uh, and I give a lot of credit to Apple because they have opened the doors for everyone else to do it. Uh, yeah. In terms of security, uh, those who were, I think I, if I remember correctly in 2012 and 13, even I was not sure uh, using Apple devices or the things which needed security, my banking, uh, the wallet. Right. I was one of the later users who started using an Apple wallet because I was not sure mm -hmm. about security. But they have made us all so comfortable that we can use it. Now, most of the payments that are coming are coming online. Apps has played another role. We have we have gone from uh, websites to apps. Sure. That is enabling customers to do on their own. And right. we have all this technology upgrades with what happened in 2020 with Corona, where everyone one was forced to go online. Yeah. Whether it was the retailer. So even in a... a, a updated a uh, growing country like UAE, I know of retailers who refused to go online, but Corona forced them to go online. And now they are online. I knew customers, even someone like my father, who was never doing anything online. He, he never believed in online business. Now, right. even now the Corona has finished and everything is finished, all his transactions are now online. Sometimes I have to control him that, that he's like, you can go to the bank. He's like, no, everything is online. Where would I go? Technology club with the factor that Corona hit us in 2020 that increased the space. So it's not Corona that brought in the technology. It's the technology was always there. It's Corona has only increased the pace where everyone is using it. Now, I customers are very comfortable. Sorry. Accelerating the adoption, that's all. Yeah, the customers are very comfortable right now using mm. technology for their online purchases. Companies like ours are buying and selling cars on a daily basis on website without the customer. So it's happening on the app right now. Uh, hmm. We'll talk more about Carnap, but Carnap is a business that we launched a couple of years back where you can actually buy a car online without test driving, without right. seeing, without even visiting our showroom. And that is happening on a weekly basis. Customers are now buying properties. So UAE uh, is also known in a big way for its real estate. And uh, for many years, Indians have been the biggest investors, not for the last right. 20 years. But I think three years and before Indians have been the biggest investors of real estate in India, huh? they have not visited. They have been investing using the online platforms which are there. So I think, yeah. it's, as you rightly said, it's uh, enabling technology. And I think I'll give a small factor of uh, Corona also that happened. Corona, of course, accelerated. So but generally you're saying that there's a lot of more comfort with technology overall. And that's what is leading to more behaviors shifting online, which were otherwise offline. But does this also mean for companies which are non-Amazon and non, let's say, Instagram to have a certain level of level uh, of experience because the customers are a little spoiled now. Mm -hmm. He's not going to settle for a suboptimal experience, which means, you know, and this example was given to me by somebody uh, in a very different industry. I think a car service or automotive manufacturing industry. So when I order food from a Zomato or a Swing in India, I know where my delivery guy is. Why can't I know what is the status of my car production? Turns out one of the leading automotive companies in India are now showing this to the consumer that, okay, this is your car production status. This is your expected date of delivery. So, you know, trying to understand from your lens on digital adoption and it's a very uh, high involvement affair to sell a car is not cheap. It's not something which would be worth a few hundred dollars. It'll be substantial. It's a high involvement, expensive conversation to have. And you're saying people are self-navigating themselves through this journey. 
in terms of the expectations set from the smoothness of this experience and the room to maintain trust to maintain that level of user experience that it doesn't drop off how do you look at this lens how is this changed for you how have you made sure that this experience is as smooth as it can be in your or the in, uh, in your applications see ankur uh, for most of the human beings a uh, car would be the second most expensive asset they would own in right. a lifetime after the home yeah after property uh, generally cars are the second most expensive assets that we own so whether we are selling a car whether we are buying a car it's generally an important decision in life and sometimes it's an emotional decision also we get customers who come in and they actually kiss the car when they leave so it's an emotional moment for them that they get part it has been a part of their family right i think uh, what we have to do is uh, get that trust from the customer that he is making the right decision mm-hmm. i'll and i'll explain it to you with two examples and one of is one example is the selling car business something that we lost 10 years ago so when we see traditional way of buying and selling cars in uae and in most of part of the world is that you uh, go out and you go out to the dealer shops you negotiate with them a dealer offers you a price uh, obviously he's trying to make margin off you you are someone who doesn't who's not in the market you have no clue about uh, a normal customer does not have a clue about the demand and supply right so you don't know what the actual price of the car is the dealer tells you there are so many problems in the car no one is going to buy it so instead of 100000 i'll buy it for 75000 you think about it you discuss it with couple of your friends and then depending upon how good negotiation skills the dealer is possessing you will actually end up selling right. your car at a price which is not exactly a fair price right mm-hmm. now uh, we migrated from that dealer shops in ua we went to classified websites where everyone uh, classified websites came in where we or have the ability to list our cars and i've done that yeah. in the past i i've sure. listed my cars on classified websites but what happens in classified websites and what is that uh you list the car and then there are your number is exposed to all the people and then there are 15 people calling you in middle of a meeting in middle of the office timing sometimes late in the night sometimes in the middle of a podcast and sure. then these people are log calling you they are giving you not right. an accurate price because they just want to get that car cheap uh from you and they'll and come they'll ask you 100 question you know to entertain all of them you can't say absolutely. no it's, it's but, just... but the last time i sold my car which was about 6 years ago was uh, that i had to go on test rides with strangers and exactly. this is not appropriate and mm-hmm. you know maybe i am comfortable going out uh, maybe i am not comfortable sending my 20 year old son on a test ride or maybe i am not comfortable with my Besides, wife i don't even know uh, as an individual while i might be a fond car enthusiast i don't know if i can really take all the 110 boxes i must take i won't know how what's wrong with the car in a test ride absolutely and then they start asking you questions so there is a sound coming a sound which you cannot even hear so <laughs> so all this was happening on classified websites and then uh, cut to you have got selling car where you say right. uh, where we say that uh, we already have a network of thousands of dealer dealers at the back end we yeah. have created an app we have got two user journeys here one yeah. journey is for the front end customer who is selling a car so right. there is a front end journey for him where we say that either you can book an appointment at any of our branches we give you a free inspection the inspection runs we click photographs we uh, answer about 180 questions about your car details there are thousands of dealers who are looking at your car who are participating in an auction so if anuprat wants to buy the car from ankur and anuprat is these are the only two people in the room and i offer a price of only 75 to ankur ankur is forced to sell it for 75 yeah so imagine understand. there is anuprat and there then there is gaurav and there is a b c d there are 10 15 20 dealers who are sitting in this room and the moment ag says 75 someone says 76 and someone says 80 and 85 the chances of you getting a better price or a fair price is much higher than dealing with an individual Absolutely. So with this as in, well market as it gets right the classic it, economics exactly exactly but imagine all this happening in 30 minutes it, it's not a 3 day process that i'm talking about so we have gone from 2 months to 2 weeks now we are talking about all this can happen in 30 minutes if you are happy with the price we can sign the purchase agreement we can pick up the car so that's one user journey now why uh, this user journey is successful with us is because we have trans- we have been transparent with the customers at every stage of what is happening sure. so if you go to our website we give you a quick evaluation of your car you enter uh, mm-hmm. basic details in 15 seconds you get a basic price that depends on the same make model year of yeah. what has happened in the past on these type of cars you've been so selling have- hundreds of cars so you pretty much know 
world no, will go. We have the second largest uh, database after the government agency. 60% of the UAE cars have gone through a panel at some stage, right? At some stage. So, so we know what is happening. We've got 25 million data points with us. So we know what is happening here. We give a fair evaluation. We mm. even offer a free home inspection that, oh, uh, there is a working man who is busy at the office or a working lady who is busy at the office, not possible to come to the branch. Okay, no problem. We'll send someone to your sure. place, whether it's your home or, or whether it's your office, we mm. evaluate. And at every stage, we show the prices that, see, this is the price, what is happening. And we offer the price minus our margin. We take the car away. All, all this can happen. The, the customer can get the payment on the same day. If, if you sell right. the car to me at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's quite possible you might get the payment by 10 o'clock in the evening. So that's one user journey by keeping transparent. The second user journey was about the dealers, as I rightly said, uh, that you they are at the app at the back end. They trust the reports. They have never seen the car physically. And sure. these dealers get practically 15 minutes to buy the car. So they know, but they are the experts. The advantage that they have right. and we have with them is that they know what a price of a car is. So they're not guessing it. They trust the inspections that we are doing. They trust the condition of the car that we are telling them. They tr because uh, there is no way they can see the car and we are supplying n number of cars on a daily basis to them so the supply that we have is huge so that, that right. there is that trust that we have gained with them of course there is a qa process uh Ankur, where even when we buy the car we take the car all the cars go to our hub we check whether the inspection report matches or not so there is a separate qa team because we have to make the user journey good even for yeah. the dealers here the dealers. So that's where the trust has been built uh, in, in terms of selling car. But if I give you example on the retail part of Carnap, which is a business which we launched two, uh, two years ago, where we are selling cars to the customer. So we uh, we have inventory and we are giving offers. So when we launched, we didn't, uh, we launched this concept of Carnap when we were listening to our customers. You know, customers said that you have given me an opportunity to sell the car. I want to buy the car. Where should I go? And we said, okay, we are here uh, and we build that business. We heard our customers, we had customer focus groups and we heard them what their pain points were. The pain points were that if a customer buys a car and he takes him home or takes the car home and if the wife doesn't like it, there is no chance for him to return the car, right? So <laughs> there's no chance. We heard them. We said 10 day return policy, no questions mm -hmm. asked. So we don't ask them any questions, any problems. You can take a car, drive it for 10 days. Of course, there are terms and conditions. There's limit on the number of kilometers. A fair usage policy is there. And then if you don't like the car, we're happy to take it back. So we heard them. The second thing was that it's a used car, right? It's not a new car. So there is always that fight, which I also had before I joined this business, where I should buy a new car and an old car. We said, okay, we hear you. Uh, we'll give you a two-year warranty. And these are something that no one is doing in the market, right? So that trust we have built. The third biggest problem I'm sure uh, that happens across the globe is financing. So more than 80% of the customers buy their cars on loans, right? And dealing with banks is a pain point. We said, don't sure. worry, we'll deal with it. So we do all the financing work. We have tie up with all the leading banks in the UAE. And when, once a customer comes to us, our objective is to provide a hassle-free experience. We give them sure. what they want. So it's very interesting the way the whole ecosystem is playing out, right? You're procuring cars in a seamless fashion on one side. You're also refurbishing. So I'm assuming there's a bit of operational infrastructure there. You're doing QA over there. And then you have a customer who's also uh, looking for this car. So that, that whole loop gets completed. In some sense, it's extremely efficient. It's extremely effective from a price point of view, from an experience point of view for the customer on both sides, right? He's pretty much giving it away online 30 minutes and he's done. He doesn't have to hassle. He doesn't have to haggle on pricing. And on the other side, the guy is getting something which has a two-year warranty. Uh, so in general, has this uh, meant a lot of incremental improvements, I would imagine? So what has been, let's say, the funnel of all the people who come and consider selling a car to the number of people who actually end up selling the car? Uh, there's a funnel, I'm assuming, and that's uh, that's how marketers talk, right? That's the language I always understand. Uh, what has been your biggest lever to improve that uh, conversion? So there are conversions at different levels that we track. So unlike only the conversion to the purchase, which is not uh, according to... That's the final event. Yeah. So you have to... There are... Advert uh, we are spending a lot of money on marketing, right? So the first right. conversion in the funnel that we want to see is that from watching an ad, how many customers are we able to bring to our websites? And then mm -hmm. from websites, how many of them are able to book a, a free home inspection or a free visit, free appointment at our branches. So that's another conversion right. that we have. Mm -hmm. Then we have got show operate conversions where we track where after booking an appointment or booking a free home inspection, how many of them actually show up? Not everyone sure. shows up. Then after the inspection, 
is the final phase where we say okay how many of the cars are we purchasing are able to purchase uh, by far we have industry uh, best standards across the globe sure. we have very high conversion rates and i think it's all because of the transparency that we have so sure. you can build a robust process you can build a, a robust company with all the right things uh, done but if you're not able to educate the customer on what is happening sometimes that can also become a challenging part Absolutely. what we do is we keep everything transparent right and we are able we are explaining at each and every step to the customer what is happening as long as the customer is trusting us for doing what we are doing right. they are comfortable this customer unfortunately in our business we are not in the business of selling uh, products where the customer will always come to me and buy it we are not selling ice creams we are not selling it's not, high it's not a high frequency category hopefully high, yeah the average of hmm. age of a car in ua is about 4.2 years and many of our customers okay. use that for 6 years right so if you are selling a car today to me the chances of you coming back is after 4 4 and a half years sure. how do i retain you right hmm. how do i retain you the point is if i serve you well you may not come to me every month but you will definitely send your friends and family to me every month right every time you have a contact who uh wants to sell a car or buy a car and if you yeah. had a good experience you will ensure that you mention yeah. there is a lot of advocacy that will get involved yeah so that's what i am talking about that uh, the the frequency is not very high but the valuation is very high it's it's a product which is close to people's heart uh it's many times it's also emotional as i said buying a car absolutely uh, selling a car is sometimes an emotional moment also for families mm. but as long as we are providing transparency trust i think we are good mm. You know, so there's this uh, whole brand lens somewhere that these are people who stand for these values, and that's the part that you'll want to communicate across a lot of touch points. People should feel that they can trust you in very, very, very serious ways, and that's a consistent piece you will do. So there's this whole right brain storytelling, confidence building, trust gaining kind of things, and then you said that you were this PNL guy as well. So you will have all of this analytical left brain thinking as well, which will talk about okay, these are the five steps of the funnel, like you just described. It's it's music to my ears to talk the language of funnels. because that's where each of these drop offs are happening and this quarter these are the five experiments we're running to make this step a little less right just a very simple example and we do business with some car companies in india as well uh the reminder of the appointment and the ability to easily reschedule without having to speak to somebody itself improves a certain step around the show up rate the one that you mentioned so i'm curious if there are uh, let's say these articulated steps in the funnel that you already spoke about if you run a set of experiments at each of these stages which have helped you you know in a meaningful fashion improve something yeah see uh, uncle we are available in two different countries so we have an operations in uae we have also operations in ksa uh, we have not made the mistake of doing everything that we do in uae we have copy right. pasted in ksa it doesn't work this way sure. the customer clientele is different in ksa we have a different requirement these customers have different requirements so there are some localization that happens the concept is same of buying cars right. we call it a different brand name for example we call it sell you sell any car in uh, ua the same concept in ksa was launched with with the brand name kaisha kaisha in arabic means cash it right so when the market, we hired the marketing agencies they came back and said this is a word which resonates more with with the saudi customers sure. that itself mm-hmm. is listening to the customers then we have also found out that the show up rates you, you spoke about the show up rates both the countries have different show up rates for example if someone books an appointment and this is something which is uh, like evident uh, if you talk about germany for example the germany car business is once a customer books an appointment it doesn't get cancelled there is no need for a, a reminder to them there is no need yeah. for a reminder call if they want to postpone or cancel the appointment the customer yeah. calls the call center and says hey yeah. sorry i am not able to show up at 3 o'clock i will come tomorrow can you reschedule and depending right. upon whether the appointment is available or not they reschedule yeah, yeah in ua there is a requirement of a reminder call so we have a call center team we call it the uh, service uh, delivery team their job is uh, to give a call to the customer hey sir you have an appointment at one o'clock just reminding you that will be there this is the location mm-hmm. this is your car this confirming that you bring in your these documents in saudi we are finding out that there is a need of more than one calls So one call may not be enough. Maybe you need to call them thrice to for the customer to show up. So I think it's always uh, good when to localize, go and find out what the customer needs, and mm. all these actions that I'm talking about, customer, customer, customer. Where is it all leading into? It's all leads into PNL. 
a better show of rate for the business is good for the customer, good for my partner, good. but it's also good for my PNR, right? More customers, more business. In fact, it's a, it's a bit of a complex operation, but it's worth the while because you have multiple locations, multiple customers, multiple uh, people who need to call every day, right? So it's it's a complex operation. But if and multiple man, nationalities, Ankur. So we, huh? we have served Nationality. 98% of nationalities in the world have been huh? served by selling car at some stage, Ankur. Right. So just the complexity of this, but what you hear, what I hear you say is just worth it because the delta that you're able to bring in these show up rates ends up adding to the funnel downstream. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, help me understand something, Anurudh. A typical car uh, selling experience is a first step. Typically, it's a, what, two, three week journey when somebody decides to sell for the first time and they end up actually making a transaction. Or do you believe they're doing faster? Uh, it is a two, three week process. If you go on uh, outside, if you want to deal with a dealer, uh, it's a, it's a very do people also still look for, can I still find something else better than sell my car or do people feel that this is good enough and let's move on? Now, there are always customers who think that, see, it's it's a product. As I said, it's, uh, it's an emotional moment. All sure. the customers think that, uh, and they will, it's natural for them to think. Even I would think that my car is worth more than what I'm getting. So it's sure. price is the only hindrance there in the mind. Right. It's, it's never the service. And as long as it's mm -hmm. not a service, I'm fine. We should be offering right. the best product and the best service. I think the only mental blockage sometimes the customers may have is uh, about the pricing that they think they can get a better price outside. And sure. as long as you can, fantastic. If someone is able to offer a good price, sure, you should sell the car outside. You should sell the car wherever you're getting the best price. Of course. But there are customers who don't want to go to the hassle. Correct. I'm one of those customers and I'm not saying it because I work here, but I, I don't want to list my number. On not a worthy hassle. No, I was only curious from a lens that uh, from a moment I first decided to sell the first time I listed got the quotation, I will have second thoughts, I will want to explore, I will want to talk to friends, this and that. And the journey between this decision to sell versus the actual sell can sometimes be a multi-day affair. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to understand that in terms of the interventions that need to be made to continue that confidence and that journey is a very meaningful space to kind of understand consumer thinking, consumer preferences and nudge him towards just the next step. Sure, sure. I just want to add in here that... Uh... There are customers who want to sell their car today. As I said, I was giving right. my example that I don't want hassle. So whether right. you give me uh, uh, a good experience, as long as you are treating me with respect, I'm getting right. a good experience. I'll, I'll, I would prefer a hassle-free experience. Correct. But there are customers. We are living in a country where a majority of the population is expats. 73% so right. of the population is expats, right? So there are customers. If a customer knows that he has to leave in 30 days and he comes to me, he knows he's not going to sell the car today. So he takes the price from me. He can go outside. Mm -hmm. He can go outside. Many, many a times, Ankur, it happens that there are customers who come back to us 10 days later saying, oh, I came in here. And we know the customer came in because right. of the details. The moment yeah. there is a check-in process. So the moment the customer right. checks in, we know that the customer was here 10 days with this car and this was the price. And he wants the same price. And what happens in our business is we are not buying the car. Right? I just said, sorry. <laughs> No, see, we try to get him a better price also. We of try course. to get him the same price, even a better price. The thing is that we are not in control because but we are not buying a fresh deal. deal. So he should know that this deal is no longer available. Yeah. So we have to repush the car. We have It's like a new inspection. Uh, we have It goes through the entire funnel again with the dealer. Has... And it depends. We are a marketplace. So there is always a, yeah. market, a demand supply situation in the car market. Sure. So uh, one and a half, I would say two years ago when the when we were just coming out of Corona and there was a chip shortage globally, the prices of the car, right. cars were insane. None of the new dealerships had any cars. The second hand right. market was very high. The prices Beautiful. were very high. And then sure. suddenly the chips started to come in and suddenly the prices dropped by as high as for some of the brands right. at 25%. So people who were right. sitting on the inventory suffered. I know our, our colleagues and friends suffered. In our business, we don't determine that 25% high or 25% low. We are a marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it's a demand supply. But again, my message to the customers uh, is that you de you decide where are you getting a better price. Awesome. If you are getting a better price dealing with one customer, fantastic. But we don't have one customer. We have got thousands of customers looking at it. Absolutely. And that what intrigues me is now typically when I'm selling a car, I'm probably also likely to buy a car because, I mean, unless I'm leaving the country, then it's typically a replacement use case. I'm probably upgrading or swapping or something. Sure. Do you see this behavior that a lot of people are selling here today and they got money here today and they're like, buying on the other side tomorrow yeah that's why we you have a consumer this is the reason for car nap so uh, yes, on a monthly basis we have i won't say it's a huge number but we have a significant number who is selling the car to us in selenica and then they're buying the car from car nap so two days ago we had uh, a gentleman who sold his car to selenica 
uh, I won't reveal the price, but then he got a particular amount for that. He said, hang on, keep my money with you. Don't pay me. And then exactly. uh, we have, he went to our showroom and he bought a car. He only paid the difference. So he yeah. only paid the difference. He bought a car. Exchange affair to me almost makes it seem like a multi-month lease business because I could just keep changing my cars every once in a while. Absolutely. Assuming I'm not you know, banging them and you know, destroying the car. I'm getting decent value out of the whole exercise. It can be a relatively more uh, smooth experience, no? Absolutely. It's a beautiful experience. And to facilitate that, apart from the two things that I already spoke about, about the 10-day free return, I spoke about right. two-year warranty, right. something that you would have not heard on mm-hmm. this market and for such a product, high-value product. Uh, we are also offering a 2,000 dirham voucher. So if you come and you sell your car at Selling Car, to encourage you to buy from Karna, we offer a 2,000 dirham voucher. Ah, there you go. So, so that's your customer acquisition hook for the other side. Absolutely. See, the, we capture these details. Yeah, absolutely. It's a perfectly uh, targeted audience, right? You see, see, Uncle, what are the reasons the customer sells, the, why the customer sells the car? So we capture that reason in the customer journey. Right. So the customer journey that customer uh-huh. has to answer these questions. Either he's leaving the country, either he is upgrading to another car, Which or is he needs money urgently. Right. Hmm. If he's upgrading right. to another car, we already have a business. Correct. Why not show him the cars? Why not answer? Hmm. And that's where we want to be. So we want hmm. to be a place where, uh, irrespective of whether a customer is selling a car or buying a car, we should play a role in his life in that. Uh, Absolutely. A fair role, uh, not a forceful hmm. role, because sometimes monopolies are not good. But here we want to play a role where we give the customers a good option. That's it. You know, you spoke about those 180 inspections in the car, but a car also has, I don't know, 100 features. The door, the, I don't know, the way the music system works, the way the sunroof opens, there's a whole bunch of these attributes to a car. And I was having this conversation with Spinny, which is a customer in India, and that's also in a similar space where they buy and sell cars. And turns out people want to buy a Mercedes from a certain time period with a certain level of mileage, with a certain level of uh, tire health, and a certain level of sunroof. You know, so those are all the attributes that the buyer is looking for. And they may not be a car in the market today for this. But in two weeks from now, if there's a car like this that's available, you tell him, he'll be like converting in 30 minutes. Yeah, so yeah. once we spoke about the seller's journey, that could take a couple of weeks. What is the nature of the buyer's journey on the other side of the equation? How long do they typically take from coming in to then uh, eventually buying? See, I'll tell you, if a customer is a cash customer on car now, we finish the journey in three days flat. So, uh, okay. If it's a cash customer, the car is delivered to him and three days is an extension. So uh, after transaction, right? Uh, so from the consideration to the transaction itself is a journey no, or the to delivery of the car. Yeah, yeah, sure. So when the guy first came to the website, he was clear that he wants to buy a car. He made an order on that day and you delivered in three days, everything done. But do most people order the first time they come to the website or people are in this browsing mode for a while before they buy? Yeah, I think the most what we have found out by experience is many a times uh, the customers are confused what they want. So we have to actually help them on what they want. And some very basic questions like, what, what do you want the car for? Do you want it for a family? How many kids do you have? What is the age of the kids? Or if you are single, are, are you off-road guy? Like right. there are many people who, who like to sit in a Jeep Wrangler, but they don't know it's right. not the most comfortable car for a Sheikh Zed road to drive at 140. <laughs> but if you are an off-road guy, that's the car you want. If you have a child uh, which is still sitting in a car seat, would SUV be a much safer option? So right. uh, all these things, customer requires uh, requirements are generally focused only on budget. Sir, what is your budget? Right. No, mm-hmm. it's not budget all the time. Mm-hmm. It's what his requirements are. And that is where we come into the picture. We don't call our guys the sales executives. We call them the relationship managers who I help the right. customer. Mm-hmm. So suppose you come to our website, Ankur, and, and you don't find the car that you want and you leave your number there. Right. Uh, our guys reach out and capture the requirements one, two, three, four. And mm-hmm. then on most cases, we find that we have the car that the customer needs. He just didn't know right. what he needs. Because yeah. there is no retailer in the world who can have the number of cars wanted by different sets of customers. I'll tell you right. what, even if you consider a Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser may have six different variants. Sure. These six different variants may have six different colors. So the Land Cruiser alone would have 36 uh, different variants Absolutely. that you need to have in inventory. And yeah. then these 36 variants are applicable for, for customers who are buying new cars. Imagine a customer saying, I only want to buy a new model. Exactly. So 
So I want a 22 model or I want less than 50,000 kilometers. So Correct. it's practically not possible to have all the cars in the inventory even if you're working on an inventory model. What is more important is to understand the customer needs and give him what he wants. Hmm. I think gradually this industry will also work upon where I think Apple has migrated. So another time I mentioned yeah. Apple is because I think what they have done is something beautiful. Uh, when I buy Apple products, so I've become an Apple product user uh, oh. since last five years. There's no coming back from there, is it? <laughs> When I have to buy a MacBook, uh, Angur, I don't need to visit a store. I don't need to go right. to Dubai Mall to see, hey, what are the options? I just go on. That's what, it's just default, right? It just yeah. comes. Same with iPad. So as long as I know what the product is, uh, what my need is, I know what I need. And I, I just order it online. I think gradually we'll move towards it. There is a big shift which is already happening now. From an offline trading to an online trading, uh, we are going from about what 3% online business I think in the next five years or so, we will hit 50% online business. The way things are changing globally, okay. everyone is going online. No, actually, this is the future. Like we have got 32 I'm online retailers. I'm really happy that happens. I'm yeah. as comfortable with digital ecosystem as anybody can be. So by all means. See, Angkor, uh, what are the most expensive things we buy? We buy gold. Gold has gone online. Everyone is trading gold online. online. ETFs are there. The banks are allowing you to buy right. online. Uh, I'm telling you properties are being sold online. There are two Absolutely. big names in UA that are selling property online to people who are not even here, right? And they yeah. give you a 3D demo. You actually walk through it. You walk through it. It's not a video video. Now, uh, one of the leading car retailers in US have actually put a full time uh, team who are just showing the car. So if you want to have a demo of the car, you don't even need to go to the showroom. You're sitting on your couch with your family, with your parents and your kids watching the TV where the guy is giving a demo. And you are telling him, open the boot, or can you open the back door, or can you start the car, I want to hear the sound, or can you increase what? the mu music volume. All this is happening at home. Virtually. Technology is helping us move much faster now. Speed is one of the things that technology has brought in. I think it is one of the most underrated things, but I think speed is one thing that technology has brought in amazingly well. We went from having our deliveries, uh, if we order something in 2006, we mentioned 2006, those were the mm. times where a courier would take about a month to be delivered to us. We went from them to a place where the courier started to come in one week. While was uh, while I was at uh, in electronics, we were the first one to launch a policy where we said, "You order online, we will do 48 hours right. delivery." So that was huge. And then from 48 That's hours, right. while I was still in electronics, we said same day delivery, which was a challenge. Now in UAE, it's very common to have a 15, day, a 15 minute delivery. So if I order even a grocery or a coffee or whatever, I know in 15 minutes, I'm going to get it. That's the problem right. that I have here. Again, the customer gets spoiled and that's why they start expecting similar experiences elsewhere, right? Yeah. I so think, help me understand something. I've been always meaning to ask this question of somebody who's in the kind of business you're in. Why not uh, be a subscription business as well? You're sitting on all that inventory. You anyway have that cash invested. So all of these cars that are lying there will probably get some usage. So a couple of feedbacks, not that it is a bad idea. It is not. Uh, secondly, we are not an inventory model. So we don't, we sell the car even before we buy it. So it's not okay. that we are sitting on huge inventory. Also inventory mm. is a very risky situation to be in, right? So right. the car practically in the financial books, the car depreciates almost two and a half percent every month. So okay. if you're sitting on a car for four months, yeah, the value has already gone down. So mm. the question is whether you want to be there. Is it I don't know of many online retailers globally who are on an inventory model making money. I'm proud mm -hmm. to say that Carnam is an inventory model and we turned profitable in record time. Record time we have turned profitable and since we turned profitable, it's been more than a year. We have not looked back. We have been growing there. But not every inventory model can be profitable. Yeah. Uh, as I said, men I mentioned before that you need to know what a customer wants. But if customer mm -hmm. may want a Land Cruiser mid-option car, and you have a Land Cruiser mid-option car, 2020, which customer wanted, but customer wanted a red color, you have a blue color. You got stuck. How much is 2.5% per month sounds like a fairly phenomenal key reason why this is anything else is not worth it. And in some sense, it's just too expensive to run this. Yeah. But that would also mean that the whole uh, replenishment rate from a retention lens that, okay, I'm going to replace the car only every so often. I won't be doing it more often than this. Because it's just too expensive to do that in that lens. Do so help me understand this, Anurath. Uh, you spent time in fairly large corporations. You spoke about this being a very agile kind of startup space. 
just in terms of maturity of uh, retention practices or marketing technologies or user experience with data driven kind of insights and interventions what's been your lens on how it has evolved where it stands right now because sharab ji i'm sure has its own set of uh, great experiences i get their whatsapps all the time but uh, ultimately it's still a fairly complex organization a lot of different technology silos in motion there's a little uh, organizational push that needs to happen to make a little more seamless experiences so what's your assessment in terms of how is it shaping up on the maturity scale if you were to define that okay this is my scale 1 this is my scale 10 i think these guys are here these guys are here these guys are here of course they're all in that forward motion they have their own velocity so i'm by no means judging anybody but it's just getting a glimpse of how the market looks right now yeah uh, i wouldn't rate it on a scale of 10 it would be unfair for me i don't think i am qualified enough to rate the market on where they are but i am a bit disappointed i will express this i am a bit disappointed mm-hmm. with where we are in online e-commerce if i have to mention that okay. i think when uh, it was around 2012 2013 when we went aggressive in uh, launching online businesses and everyone who was going online somehow mistook it as a discount store so online yep. was never wanted or never supposed to be a discount store mm-hmm. online was supposed to be facilitate that if you know what you right. want we'll deliver it to your place right correct we've got brands uh, it could be an electronics it could be an adidas if you know your shoe size and if you know that you want a superstar and your shoe size you don't need to visit dubai mall you can directly offer online right but what i think mistake most of the e-commerce companies or the companies who went online did was they launched with massive discounts and discounts are good to bring top line they're never good to bring in bottom line yeah so what are we trying to do with customers so what we have done over a period of time as retail uh, is that we have taken the customer out of our stores and we have put them on the website the right. same customer who was paying more for the same product is now paying less by sitting at home so we have increased our own costs uh, by offering these discounts so i'm not increasing the I'm I'm not a big fan of offering discount discount right. I'm a big fan of offering good services facilitating right. what customer needs uh and if a customer needs the same day delivery please by all means uh modify your process to deliver it the same day mm-hmm. if my customer is have 72% of my deliveries happen to the dealers in less than 3 days in less than 72 hours right that's what so that's what dealers want they want to buy cars fast queue it done everything title transfer done by all means do it but saying that oh uh this festival is coming 10% discount this festival is coming 50% discount i think what most of the retailers uh, have been according to me again this is my personal opinion is right. that we i think we have been guilty of offering too much discounts now what people are doing is, is when uh, you know that you have, you have to buy suppose you have to buy a hand soap right i know where you headed so you you have to buy a hand soap you and you know that every 3 months this guy is coming on discount you stock it up for 3 months and now yeah. the next three months the guy is uh, full price paying expensive rents but not getting customers and then suddenly they go on discount boom the people stop oh, i think uh, it's pretty even worse uh, when you know that you want to get a abandoned cart ke baad a uh, notification which will offer a discount you on purpose abandon the cart so i added something i'm waiting now the brand will send Absolutely. me the charge back so i mean in some sense it became a greedy for an accelerated growth online it seems somewhere that kind of where you lost track of whether this is a good long term idea or not because it's very tempting to just have a quick uh, win quick ramp up of revenue online right somebody's kpi is getting met perhaps but then uh, going forward down two years down three years this is the behavior that you will come back it's going to come back to hurt you mm-hmm. so from that lens i'm very uh, glad to you know uh, observe of course whole part around the profitable operation the whole lens on a uh, financial aspect of everything the 2.5% is on your tips the 72% of your cars delivered in three days on your tips so the very strong handle on operations a strong handle on customer experience uh, which aids uh, making of a you know long term sustainable profitable business and in terms of just the understanding of the key challenges that you believe people face when it comes to adopting the right kind of technology pieces across the board because this is not something which we just you know do without a certain amount of investment in technology a lot of these pieces i'm sure have the right components plugged in what's your lens on either building technology teams assembling technology components from different source service providers how do you not make some classic mistake that some of these people have made because we've seen people go online do all of the discounting but not do a great enough job on customer experience perhaps on the delivery side of things even the payment side of things sometimes the retention side of things you had this huge sale that came up uh you brought a whole bunch of people but now they're all gone 
right? So I'm trying to understand how do you approach this from a lens where somebody can avoid some of these mistakes. See, uh, you talk, you spoke about the technology. So I will address that first. Uh, sure. We are a company who have always used technology that we have built. So we rarely go outside for our needs, uh, except where we are not the experts. So mm. we we do we like to do things in house at Selenicar. We like to do things in house, but we do acknowledge that there are some expertise that we also need to do uh, with partners outside. For example, I think the first time we went outside was when I joined. So when we launched the Karna business, we wanted a background. We didn't want to right. show the photographs. So we wanted a decent showroom background. Mm. We tied up with a company in India to to help us with that because for us building that software would have taken a longer period. It's not worth. So instead of building it for whatever uh, number of weeks or months we needed, we wanted it fast, we, we outsourced it. And the same mm. goes for any other place where if not we are the experts, we should build it in-house. If we are not, mm. there is no harm in partnering with others. In terms of uh, when you spoke about customer retention, uh, customer retention is a very tricky thing now. And I'll, I'll go back to uh, the discounts game that retailers have been uh, playing. Sure. Who are you loyal to right now? When you go uh, online, I'm sure you travel, Ankur. Is there a fixed airline you like to travel with? Or you go online and you see, hey, which... So there may be an airline you don't want to travel with. I understand. Yeah, scenario, but <laughs> that always happens. <laughs> that always happens. But there, generally, you see, okay, what are the air tickets, uh, prices around, the, the timing, services. We have to get into that mode. If we have to retain the customer, we have to offer these services. We have to get out of the price war because no one is winning no one wins not even the customer. Does. if the customer is not coming back to you even the customer is not winning because that customer loyalty in today's world uh, i don't know i mean it has become a joke where is that customer loyalty which company is working on customer loyalty everyone is working on customer acquisition another thing you mentioned in your question it's 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 easy for the marketing team to come up to me and say hey we need to offer these discounts which is one of the discussions we were having this morning actually and I told them in the plain words, no, I'm not a discount store. Like I'm not doing this. Uh, you want to acquire sure. customers, acquire on the brand, acquire on the service. Please do not uh, think that we will go on discounts all the time because it doesn't make sense. And sure, there may be times where we go on discounts, right? But it cannot be eight months a year. But Arun, tell me something. You've been across multiple industries. What are these compulsions that uh, get people to make these short-term choices? What you're saying sounds fairly wise, hmm. fairly sensible. I would imagine this to be Relatively appealing to a whole bunch of people, your peer circle of leaders in the retail, in the fashion, in the apparel, in the electronic business, also aware of these things. Yeah. But what comes in the way? What is the challenge? What is it that tempts them in order to take some of these shortcuts? I'll tell you, poor planning. So what is the okay. first step of doing any business? And let's leave car business because car business is mine. So you might think that I'm biased. Let's talk about electronics. So let's You've talk been in about businesses. We can talk about any of them. <laughs> but yeah, inventory situation is applicable for all the situations actually. Absolutely. You talk, I, I think poor planning in terms of inventory planning. So suppose I will just give you an example that suppose this market has a capacity. You are in a market which has a capacity of 1 million pairs that right. you can sell in a year 1 million pairs. What happens is when you have promises to make and you have tie-ups to do, you get in 10 million pairs. You buy 10 million pairs from a brand. Now you're sitting yeah. on an inventory of 10 million pairs and uh, 10, uh, 10 million pairs and, and the finance is actually pressurizing you. Hey, we are sitting on a huge inventory, depreciating, depreciating. There is 10% provision, 20% provision. What do you think is going to happen? So it's situation down. A, you're going to go on sale or you are going to go on offers like buy two, get one. Now there are offers buy one, get one. Some of the retailers go on buy one, get two offers. Buy one, get three offers is some banners. I'm sure you know yeah, what brands I'm talking about. So to sell, uh, they want to charge you for one, but they will give you four products at the same time. So that is mm -hmm. one situation. The other situation could be the, uh, it could be a strategic move also and where you want to have the market share. So you right. go on discounts and you have the market share. You It's a strategic move. You want to destroy the competition mm -hmm. and I completely get it. But it cannot be all the time. My thing is that if, if that market share can compensate the lack of margin that you would have generated at full price, then fair enough. But you are on one hand, you are giving it's a conscious power. strategic choice. Yeah, absolutely. It's a strategic, a strategic choice. So, uh, and, and, and these are very complex questions that you are asking, but in very simple words, I'll say it's lack of planning and it's the market share pressure that sometimes we go through. But you know, the fact is Dubai and UAE overall is a finite market. There's only so many people. So unless you drive loyalty, you will 
never be a viable business right yeah loyalty in ua market is much more tougher than it would be in india market first of all the size of the market is much smaller Absolutely. india has 140 times the population uh, but with this 10 million population we get wide variety so uh, you most point <laughs> we have different nationalities we have got different cultural things we have got different needs we have got customers uh, who have got different values right and 20% of that population keeps on changing continuously so that yeah. 10 million population doesn't mean that it's the same 10 million population that yeah. was there 5 years ago or 10 years ago so there's a constant supply of new people coming in there is obviously people who are going out as well when new people come in they what are the things that they need they need a job they need a house they need a car right okay. they need to stay so it's bringing in business where i think dubai and ua government has been excellent per se is in attracting people from around the globe so it's not one nationality yeah. that is here there are people from the west there are people from the east we have got uh, a large population from india and pakistan obviously but there are people across the globe, globe who are here now then after inviting them and facilitating them they have built a structure which actually um, encourages saving and uh, to live a better lifestyle I'm yeah. pointing towards a tax structure, like uh, a tax-free income uh, is a massive mm -hmm. boost for anyone, any part Absolutely. of the globe, right? So I think that is where the wins are coming from uh, for this market. It's a challenging market. It's a small market, but it's not what you think that oh, it's the same small market. No, we are getting new customers on a rolling mm -hmm. basis every month. Oh, there's enough money floating around. But tell me something. Now you spoke so much about the diversity of the whole situation. Um, how does your entire orchestration of the experience get any degree of standardization slash personalization uh, in the experience? So are you able to, I, I don't know if it matters to switch languages, it matters to switch some sort of communication, it matters to switch something in the entire user journey which gives them a slightly differentiated personalized experience. Thank you for asking this. So language is the first thing, Ankur, that people go to uh, and right. we do that also. So we know which language do you want and then yes, uh, we offer. But then there's 90 of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But language is not the first thing, sure. you know, the, the, and all the companies uh, need to look into it. We need to find out what your preference is. So we need to see uh, our apps are built for what, our websites are built for what. Uh, again, I won't take names, but I know of good websites that were built for desktop. Right. And, and when they did the research study, they found out more than 50% of their customers were coming from mobile. Their website right. was not built for mobile. So that's right. where the customer journey starts. Mm -hmm. that you are sending an SMS them uh, SMS uh, with a link and when they click the link it opens up on their mobile and it's not a great user journey so that's Absolutely. where the user journey starts language could be the second thing now and it's an ever evolving thing Ankur so mm -hmm. as I said before that um, uh, Indians are the largest population in UAE obviously of expats sure. but that dynamics keeps on changing right mm -hmm. uh, it could be uh, for whatever reasons the, the population of Britishers may increase more recently, we have seen uh, the population of Russians increasing in the country. So we have to evolve. We have to add these countries. So third preferred language after, say, English, Arabic, and maybe Hindi, the fourth preferred language used to be China. Right. Is it going to turn into a, a Russian language very soon? So these kind of things. Okay, we have to ready for it. And we have to keep ourselves updated of what, how their market dynamics are changing. It's very interesting. It's actually a lot more complicated than perhaps, uh, I mean, we still think of India as a advanced, but it's still somewhat homogeneous. I mean, most e-commerce is still talking by and large English. There's some vernacular play. I mean, I've seen uh, Zomato's searches on voice in multiple languages becoming a large component for them. But I can imagine when uh, the, you know, the fourth largest community from Chinese becomes Russians for you, that's a, that's a substantial difference you need to make to your entire workflow right absolutely and it does make a difference personalization is a big thing people think that personalization i've been hear, hearing this buzzword for the last 10 years but i still sure. think there's a lot to be done than that yeah absolutely i still like visiting websites whether i buy them or not but for learning purposes i visit them and imagine my experience so if you go to a website to buy a t-shirt uh what is the next thing what is the recommended product you expect uh, it could be a t-shirt it could be a jacket it could be a denims or a shorts right right but it cannot be a cooker. Like people who bought this t-shirt are also buying cooker. So sure. that's not personalization. No, like no, no ways. Then uh, there is Meta, which is which is tracking, I think if I remember correctly, 700,000 data points. They know what I want. They know what I, mm. uh, what I want, what I talk. 
if i am talking to you about a business i am sure that in my inbox gmail i will be getting something about the business yeah, if i talk to you yeah. about a airline i am sure that you will see an ad of an airline as soon as we finish the call but do i actually need it just because i am talking about it doesn't mean and that i need it and this is one place where i i've always said that companies are tracking a lot of data every website you go to wants you to sign up they want you to share your phone number they want you to share your mail id and then they capture it and then they don't know what to do about it so everyone is setting off so much of data but they don't know what to do about it the the thing is you're not capturing a mail id or a phone number just to send an sms of your edward just to send a mail of your edward why are people before they even they cap- start capturing it they need to know why they are capturing it how is it going to help them how can they use it as i said before uh, ankur that we have got 25 million data points with us related to cars and that yeah. is what helped us launch carnap so when we launched carnap and we had to buy inventory for ourselves we didn't guess work that oh we should buy a 50000 dirham car or we should buy a half a million car we should buy a white car or we should buy a black car we should buy this make model year or we should buy this make model year these 25 million data points actually as much as complex it sounds makes a make made our life easy where we knew what to get what yeah. customer what are customers selling is what customers want right so this is where it helped us build an inventory uh, by what using data i wish to start personalizing that with customers also absolutely what is getting to is it, it sounds like the whole maturity of how powerfully you're using data is not just about consumer engagement or communication it's also the fundamental business model design itself yeah right because karna originated from the idea that we're buying all this much there are people who want to buy some of this might as well just bridge that gap what to buy which ones to choose how long to keep it for a lot of those insights can come from data you know and that will help you understand something anurudh in terms of just the maturity of the market in the uae ecosystem there's a bunch of indians you are yourself an active let's say observer of multiple things that are happening around the globe what is the general sense of how aggressively are things changing things are changing very fast uh, i think that generation gap has becoming shorter and shorter i oh. think the generation gap used to be 20 years which dropped to 10 years it dropped to 5 mm-hmm. years and i think it's even lower than 5 years and that's in personal life and professional life i'll say the things are moving so wa- fast uh, if, i mean you are in the technology sector yourself the technology is changing so fast that if you're not updated uh, that could be one of the reasons to fail and technology don't forget comes at a cost right sure. so we have discussed different points in the last one hour so ankur we were talking about uh, which technology to use how to build our base it's very important to find the right technology that technology needs to be first of all uh, be ready that you can integrate with your current crn system so if i have to go outside and partner with a uh, with a third party today hmm. i need to ensure that uh, a it can integrate with my own crm i don't have to build a new crm i don't the apis are simple b it's scalable so today mm-hmm. for example i have got 1 million customer will my website crash if there are 1 million customers like i think this is the biggest crime when there is uh, there are customers who are trying to access you and you're not able to serve them that's the biggest crime yeah i remember you spoke about the retail experience with a huge queue the teller yeah, i mean yeah. it's a good problem to have but not if your website is crashing absolutely not if your website is crashing and the third mm-hmm. one i think is apart from scalability is the cost factor also sure. but uh, you need to tie up invest into a technology or a partner that is cost effective to your business you mm. can have the best technology in the world but if you are not able to use it then it's of no use my father and mother stay in law i am uh, and they stay alone while my sure. father is still working they uh, it's a beautiful thing i love an online platform uh, right. when i go to india so i do all my payments through that online pl- platform right. and for some reason my father was not able to use it that online platform is such a good thing to use but they didn't make it user friendly for the elderly so even though right. i tried explaining it to them they couldn't so they had the best technology for me it's brilliant but for right. elderly people does it suit the needs of all your customers that you are trying to attain that's where the technology fails so they so have the best technology but not so friendly you know one of the ways we talk about the same thing that you just said is the fact that you would buy a jet plane and use it like an auto rickshaw if you don't know how to fly it really yeah and uh, one of the things we see happening often in terms of just as a mistake people tend to not work backwards from the strategy i mean the tooling has to happen after you already know what you want as an outcome yeah. you can buy the right kind of technology to make that outcome happen you don't go technology shopping and then wonder 
you know, this thing has this, this thing has this, this, maybe I can do this with this. Yeah. And that seems to be a fairly common uh, mistake people tend to make because uh, if you do tooling before strategy, then you will buy the tool comparing features, but ultimately it might not serve your needs. Or you only needed 20% of the capacity for the next three years because you're never going to use all the features. Correct. Correct. Is that something you see happening from your lens? What is, uh, you know, somewhere a mature way to look at this? Yeah, 100% it's happening right now uh, with many companies. What is the latest buzzword to talk about these days is the AI, right? Everybody is talking sure. about the AI and converting into AI and we are talking about boats and we are talking about IVRs where the uh, boats are answering your calls and it's not the human cost cutting. We are saving cost in call centers. No, actually it's making the customers upset. The IVR is not understanding what customers want. The WhatsApp yeah. is not replying what we are doing. AI is great technology, but is it ready? I think people jumped onto that wagon so quickly that they have not given the time to their to the technology to understand their systems, right? Sure. AI also needs to learn and then AI can take care of the customers. But right now, where the situation is, I don't think uh, AI is in terms of in terms of uh, whatsapp chats in terms of the ivr i don't think it is helping the companies at the moment and the choice i made are not i i know companies that had uh, that has pulled back its ivr ai ivr and they've gone back to the, the manual calls and god i mean i still see i mean there's a i would imagine the scale of these companies there is and i don't know how decision making happens but i've experienced some of these ivrs with some of the airlines or the banks they make me press up seven digits before I can get to somebody. And even after that, they'll say, thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> the bad design don't want to invest in that human capacity, but that's what's annoying as a yeah. consumer, right? But regardless, I think it's very fascinating to say that you have a very methodical approach as well as a thought-through lens on what you want technology to do for you before you just go for that next shiny tool, which is not very common, to be honest. So thank you so much for doing this conversation, Anurad. It's been entirely a pleasure for me to understand uh, your journey as well as your experience. Thank you, Ankur. I appreciate you getting me online here. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, before I finish, I also have to thank you and Sakshi for meticulously planning this episode. So the, the, I've done a few podcasts earlier, but I have to thank both of you. The way you guys have planned it, the way you guys have done it is very professional. It's one of the best experiences. Thank you so I've much. Fully really appreciate it. Thank you, Ankur.